Dr. Arthur L. Kaplan is a professor of bioethics at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Um, he is the founding head of the Division of Medical Ethics um, at the School of Medicine. He had a long career at the University of Pennsylvania and before that at the University of Minnesota and also University of Pittsburgh and Columbia University. He's the author or editor of 35 books, um, the most recent of them being Vaccination Ethics and Policy. Um, you have his full bio in the bio packet, and uh, so we have a lot more of information about him. I've asked him to come talk about, about vaccines and ethics and the issues that are kind of going to be at play when this vaccine is rolled out, if and when this vaccine is rolled out. And so he's going to talk us through that. He has a presentation. If Tyler, if you could pull that up for uh, Dr. Kaplan, and um, and he'll present for he'll present for 30 ish or so minutes. And then we'll have 30 ish or so minutes for Q and A. So with that, uh, Dr. Kaplan, um, I'll turn it over to you, and welcome. Let me just say uh, how happy I am to uh, be here. Thanks to all of you for uh, taking the time to do the workshop and be at this. I can tell you uh, just. Very briefly, uh, I have been interested in vaccines ever since when I was seven years old. I had polio. I was one of the last people in America to get polio in the Boston outbreak of 1957. That's where I'm from. Uh, I saw kids in iron lungs, saw a lot of kids die on the floor. It's one of the reasons I got interested in medical ethics. It definitely made me sort of a vaccine nut. Uh, I'm very strongly pro-vaccine, I wouldn't disguise that, uh, but that uh, epidemic was uh, something that certainly uh, got my interest going in medical ethics, and I've always been interested in vaccines, even though the field of bioethics, not so much. Uh, we haven't been a field that's been great in public health ethics or, until relatively recently, um, but we've had a project at Penn on ethics and vaccines, looking at vaccine hesitancy, looking at safety issues, looking at compensation for injury questions, looking at recruitment to trials questions, and it moved uh, to NYU where we now have our working group on vaccine ethics and policy, which by the way, I chair with a guy some of you may have run into named David Oshinsky, who wrote a very distinguished book on polio, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for that book, and more recently wrote a book about Bellevue. So he's a medical historian, with an interest in vaccines, and he and I co-chair the work at NYU. The other thing I was going to tell you before I launch uh, into this is I am not, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. I do get phone calls from government people, private sector people, occasionally from uh, consumer groups, which I'll mention, like One Day Sooner, which is an effort to uh, push forward uh, challenge studies. But I, I just stay out of any kind of paid consultant work or anything like that, just uh, to remain uh, conflict-free uh, in the space. So, uh, but I do, I, I am somebody who've chatted uh, on occasion with some of the folks we're seeing in the news and their um, uh, agents. Sometimes they want to know about research questions. Sometimes they're getting ready to try and develop their thinking about distribution, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, lastly, I serve on the WHO Compassionate Use uh, COVID Committee, and that is a place where uh, some issues may come up about emergency use of vaccines, which is a little bit of an advanced topic, but one that could be with us uh, maybe this fall, and so we can talk about that later. As I roll through the presentation, I am going to pause. If somebody has a question they want to toss out, you don't have to wait 30 minutes. I'll uh, uh, take a couple and then uh, move on. Uh, and I'll just tell you when I'm doing that. So a lot of people hope that we can vaccinate our way out of this uh, pandemic. I certainly am one of those. On the other hand, if we look at the first slide here, next one, Tyler. Uh, I don't think we're gonna get a magic bullet. And one of the uh, reasons uh, why I say that is vaccines come in many degrees of efficacy. Some of them are highly effective uh, because they, they get an immune response, uh, the ability to fight the infectious agent uh, that's pretty strong. Some of them rely on herd immunity, the idea that it's hard to communicate a disease if many people are vaccinated. 
um, because the virus doesn't find a target to infect, so it slows down the spread significantly, and that helps. Uh, other vaccines require more than one dose. Uh, some vaccines have produced records of pretty poor compliance with people in getting more than one dose. HPV vaccine for cervical cancer would be a good example. Um, I think what we're going to see is some progress in vaccination next year, not this year. And I think we're going to have to continue our behavioral efforts, the masking and the distancing and the quarantining and the testing and so on in parallel with vaccination because it would be very, very surprising if we got a very highly effective vaccine, first one out of the box uh, for this particular virus. Next slide. So uh, we know that our president has not been a great source of accurate claims about uh, science when it comes to uh, COVID. I have a little quote up there about uh, drinking uh, bleach or using ultraviolet light. He's been promoting uh, HCQ for some time, even yesterday, even though the good randomized trials that have been done show no efficacy. I spared you for this presentation his thoughts about uh, not having sex with demons. Uh, one of his uh, recent uh, physician friends that he thought highly of and thought was very credible, although he said he didn't know her that well, but okay. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So uh, this was him back in March. I don't know what time uh, will be for a vaccine to be ready. I've heard quick numbers that of months, we're already getting into months but you're taking three or four months in a couple of cases, a year in other cases. So he's been very optimistic about vaccines. Uh, his, uh, I guess we could now say, uh, uh, counter figure, uh, Anthony Fauci, uh, has been saying a vaccine you make and start testing in a year is not a vaccine that's deployable. So the president wants to know when it's gonna be deployable and that's gonna be at the earliest a year to a year and a half. I think that's closer to the truth. Um, one of the problems when you see people uh, talking about vaccines is that there are political angles. If you think that a vaccine or you say a vaccine is coming soon and you imply that it will shut down the uh, uh, pandemic, then you don't have to worry quite as much about urging people to wear masks and do the behavioral modification that uh, is useful in trying to tamp down the pandemic. So it's not just a question of, yes, it would be nice to have a preventative vaccine that either didn't let us get infected or caused a reaction in us that will allow us to combat the disease. Um, but there are, if you will, uh, ways to say, don't worry, let's stick this out. We'll get a vaccine soon enough. And then, uh, you know, we'll have solved this problem. And I'm not going to uh, try and get you to either shut down or quarantine or uh, engage in uh, personal behavior that you don't like, says the president. Next slide. So when we get a vaccine in the US, uh, a candidate for some disease, whether it's measles or mumps or hepatitis or polio or cervical cancer, it kind of goes through the same process of uh, confirming that it works to get FDA approval um, that a drug does. But there are some differences unique to vaccines. Both drugs and vaccines start with animal studies and lab studies. So you can put viruses in dishes, expose them to different agents and see if they die. Um, there are certainly lab models that have been worked on for the class of viruses that this uh, uh, pandemic viruses in that COVID is in for coronaviruses. People were doing some work in lab studies and animal studies before this pandemic. That's why there is a little bit of optimism that maybe we can get there faster to get a vaccine that works because some of the basic science is un was underway. Uh, MERS and SARS are cousin uh, diseases and efforts were underway to look for vaccines for them. So uh, maybe a little bit of a head start in looking for a COVID vaccine. After you figure out that animals respond, you then move normally to what's called a phase one study. For those of you who don't remember, that's first in humans. You usually are looking for 20 to 100 healthy volunteers 
And the sole purpose of a phase one study is to determine whether a vaccine is safe. And you start by giving a small dose of the vaccine and then escalating it to bigger doses based upon what you learned in animals. So that sort of sets your range. Presuming there are no adverse events, including deaths, bad reactions, hospitalizations, you then move from phase one to phase two, which is a bigger safety look. Now you're up to a couple of hundred people in a vaccine trial. And you're also starting to see, is the vaccine provoke biological activity? Are you making antibodies? Is something happening biologically that makes you think that the activity you saw in animals is going to be produced in humans? Uh, it isn't always. Uh, for those of you who've been on the science beat, you'll be aware that uh, we're very good at curing cancer if you're a mouse. Most of the treatments, however, do not work in humans, unfortunately. So not everything pans out that looks promising in animals. Um, most of the results from Moderna and other leading vaccine candidates that have been generating headlines are in that phase two area. They're not uh, really all that interesting to me. Uh, they're interesting in that we're going to go on and have something that's worth testing. But uh, if you watch the stock market or the sale of stock by some of the uh, people in the companies, you'd think they had had a discovery, whereas basically all they've had is a phase two positive result. Phase three in drugs would involve probably, I don't know, 2,000 people recruited. Now they might not be as healthy. They might actually have some uh, diseases. They might have the disease if you're trying to test a cancer drug or a diabetes drug. And what you're doing uh, there is uh, trying to see if the uh, person will uh, respond biologically to, uh, or get better, if you will, when exposed to the, uh, when given the drug, if it helps do some of the disease. In vaccines, you're gonna use much, much bigger numbers. Vaccine studies usually use 20 to 30,000 people and that's for a variety of reasons, but it's important that you understand why much bigger trials are traditionally done. One reason is, if I give you the experimental vaccine, then I have to wait for the uh, virus in nature to uh, infect me to see whether I'm gonna do better than a group that didn't get the vaccine. Usually you have a placebo control group where you don't give them an active agent and you sort of monitor one against the other. Um, if you're waiting for natural infectivity with COVID, we have a problem. If we were gonna recruit people to a big phase three randomized trial of a vaccine candidate three months ago, we probably would have done it in New York. But now the attack rate of the virus here or in Richfield, Connecticut, in Connecticut where I am, is much less. And it will take a long time to see whether people actually get a benefit from the uh, experimental vaccine because the uh, degree to which they're becoming infected is very slow. So you'll notice that people are starting to recruit subjects for trials right now in hot spots. They may be looking at Brazil. They may be looking at uh, Atlanta. They could be looking in a region of the country that has uh, a big outbreak. But at the same time, Morally, we have to try and tell people who sign up for uh, vaccination studies that they should not get themselves infected. In other words, I have to get your informed consent and I say, you're getting an experimental vaccine. We're gonna see whether you get sicker at a rate that's less than other people who don't get vaccinated with this experimental vaccine. But while we're here, remember to wash your hands, wear a mask and do the other things you need to do to prevent you from becoming infected. That is one of the reasons why HIV vaccines, AIDS vaccines have slowed, because we're constantly telling people not to engage in the very risky behavior that you need to see whether if they get infected, a vaccine will help them. So it's a sort of moral catch-22. You can't really encourage people to be reckless and get themselves infected. So to recruit 30,000 people is no small project, even if you get them, you're not sure what the attack rate will be of the naturally circulating COVID virus to challenge the vaccine. And third problem, having been around randomized trials for a long time, people drop out. Even when they have the experimental vaccine, they don't come back or they move or something happens. 
So you're trying to do back-end uh, recruitment uh, frequently. Most of the people who come into these big vaccine trials are healthy volunteers still. They're younger. There is an effort underway uh, in the NIH-sponsored trials to try and get uh, more diversity by ethnicity and race into this pool. They say they are getting pretty good cooperation, but I don't know how close they are yet to the 20 to 30,000 uh, total that they want. And the other problem is you're probably not going to take sicker people because it makes it difficult to assess whether the vaccine is causing an adverse event or an underlying illness is causing an underlying event. Everybody follow that? So if I took someone with diabetes and lupus and uh, depression, I don't know whether the vaccine, if I see these things, is making them worse or bringing them on, or is it just that they're frail and underlying? So even though, say, a nursing home group of elderly might be the greatest at risk people, and maybe you'd think we should test it there, it's much more difficult to assess the results of a trial the sicker the population. And some of those people in nursing homes are gonna die and you're gonna to have to figure out did they die because of the vaccine or they die because of the underlying disease, they just die of old age, whatever. So people tend to look for <clears throat> what's sometimes called a clean baseline in your study sample. I wanna tell you something else here and then I'm gonna pause after this point to see if you have a question on the standard method. Phase four is watching what happens in the real world after FDA approval. If you get good enough data from a big trial, phase three, see a significant efficacy rate. Francis Collins and others, the NIH head has said 50%. Tony Fauci has said 50%. We can argue about whether 50% would be good enough or why 50%, but they're aiming for something that protects at a 50, half the people who get it and has minimal adverse events, maybe a sore arm or something like that, but nothing uh, major. If you get that, the FDA will approve it. The FDA <clears throat> also can get requests in the phase three studies for something to be given before it's approved, and that's what the emergency use uh, vaccine is all about. And that could come from a particular super high risk group to say, it look, your data is looking pretty good on the first 15,000. Give it to us now because we're at such high risk of getting infected uh, that we were willing to do it. So there might be an emergency use permitted at phase three. And by the way, that's true for drugs too. But phase four, the point I really want you to pay attention to is now you're just taking it out to the general population. Probably for the first time, pregnant women are going to be exposed. Probably for the first time, uh, uh, you're going to be exposing people in the uh, elderly and nursing home populations. You may be exposing people who are now carrying two or three underlying chronic illnesses. You may uh, see a variety, in other words, of sicker uh, people who weren't in the phase three trial. And that's just always true when you're doing these kinds of studies. But it means, and you're going to have to pay attention to this as you cover this, even FDA approval is not the green light to say we've got a vaccine and everything's over. We don't know if it's going to work in older people. Give you one example. How many of you have older relatives or old enough to know that a flu vaccine when you're over 60, it doesn't really do much for that group because they don't build much of an immune response. We have actually had to develop high dose flu vaccine. and Even that isn't that great. So there may be people who, for biological reasons, their immune systems are weak, cancer patient, transplant patient, elderly, they're not going to benefit from a vaccine. But we won't know that if we're not watching carefully as the vaccine rolls out. There may even be genetic differences between groups of people that influence efficacy that we don't really understand but wouldn't be picked up until we got into the millions and millions of people. So. That's the standard way to do it. Let me shut up there for a second, see if anybody has a question about that. Yeah, so if anybody has questions, just uh, unmute yourself and you can shout them out. Oh, Art, um, Lisa Krieger here, and um, that was lovely, thank you. Are we looking at absolute protection or could we just reduce the severity of the disease and, and call that a win also? I don't think they'll approve anything that doesn't give some protection. I think that's the 
many vaccines, flu among them, only work in a good year at 50%. But you know, it's lost in some of the reporting and some of the writing, even some of the Cochrane analyses for the use sophisticates on the call, meta studies about vaccines. They don't point out that it does reduce the severity of the illness. Flu vaccine is good, it shortens it and it makes the symptoms less. So hopefully we'll see that too, but we don't know. But they're really watching the metric of uh, efficacy to prevent. Can I ask a follow-up question with Gibbs? Uh, so we're also pursuing, of course, loss of treatments and the antiviral treatments and other treatments are likely to only reduce the severity of disease or the risk of mortality. This is gonna be happening in parallel with clinical trials and potential rollouts and emergency use authorizations with the vaccines. Is there an ethical conflict here where people who are in clinical trials for vaccines should not receive those because it was confound the results of the vaccine trials? Yeah, there is. Uh, when you're on a vaccine trial, if there were an agent that rolled out, say, into a new phase three of a antiviral drug, anti-COVID viral drug, you would not be eligible to take that. Absolutely not. And I, that has to be in the informed consent. It's an excellent question as you prowl around the space to see, are the informed consent forms warning about that? Also, if you've had one of those drugs, you'd be ineligible to enroll in the uh, vaccine trial in the other direction. So that's part of that clean sample thing I was talking about. Don't want people sick, don't want them on other drugs. You might even be asking, are they taking hydrochloroquine and alternative medicine things? I don't think you'd kick them out, but it's, I don't know, it's a question. You could look for a, a purer sample. It probably will be driven by how hard it is to recruit, to be honest as to what the exclusions are. How I have another, oh. yeah. go ahead. Uh, how risky is it, so if someone is thinking about they wanna join a vaccine trial, how, do, how risky is that? How should we be informing the public in terms of whether or not that's a good idea for their health or not? Yeah, so we go to animals, we go to phase one, we go to phase two, before we get into large scale studies, we've got this little snippet, little, small look and it says it looks pretty good in terms of safety. It isn't really telling us, in my view, anything about whether it works. You don't really get that till you get into uh, really challenging people with the naturally occurring virus. But safety, I think after phase two, you can feel somewhat confident that you're not gonna kill anybody uh, by starting the big phase three trial. And I said somewhat because there's really still no guarantee. It might have somebody who has a strange allergic reaction due to some immune thing that wasn't in the first, say 200 people that we tried in phase one and two. Uh, if you ask me, have I ever seen people die in a, a randomized phase three trial? I could think of one or two cases, but I have seen uh, adverse events from other drugs and vaccines at phase three. So small risk, but not, not huge, not huge. Also, hopefully, uh, what will normally be in place on these trials, in addition to the informed consent we were talking about, about what you can't do and what you can do and urging people not to get infected, even though the only way we're going to find out if the thing works is to get them <laughs> infected. But there's also uh, this, uh, if you will, problem or uh, difficulty that uh, people don't always do what they're supposed to do. Some of the vaccines are two shots. If you looked at the HPV vaccine compliance rate, it really nosedives after the first shot. Some people think, well, I got the shot and I don't go back. Other people think, I don't know, it was a long way to get to the trial place, so I'm not gonna do it. So watch to see also, is this a one shot or a two shot entity? Some of them are two shots. And uh, in the history of vaccines, anything like cholera, cervical cancer, Anything that's been a two-shot vaccine has turned out to be a pain in the neck. People don't comply. <laughs> I, I, they just, even if you yell at them and call them up and hector them, they still don't comply. All right, let's go on. Sorry, we'll get some more questions uh, later. Let's, this is just to show you, it's a little hard to read the slide, but it's just showing the time frame that it took to develop a lot of our vaccines. And you'll notice that it's many years, I think, uh, 
you'll see 10 years for most of these. The fastest vaccine I ever heard of was a mumps vaccine, which was actually a derivative, so it's a little cheating, but that one got approved in four years. That's the fastest one I've ever heard of. Now, does that mean it's four years for this COVID vaccine? Well, all the rest of these vaccines didn't have the entire scientific establishment <laughs> working at the same time on vaccines, so there might have been three companies chasing them or four research teams as opposed to 250, which we, is what we've got on the COVID beat. So that'll help. Uh, but still, you know, big trials, a lot of people waiting for natural infection, um, trying to figure out if you get a significant difference, watching the, it takes time. And that's why I'm not in any way convinced that we're gonna see anything this year. They're just starting to recruit the phase threes now and we'll see how fast that goes. All right, next slide. And by the way, while we're going to the next slide, let me point out, we have had failures. As somebody said on the call, maybe it was Lisa, we don't have a HIV vaccine still after, I don't know, 22 years of looking. There's no hepatitis C vaccine. Uh, there, we were getting pretty close to a Zika vaccine and then Zika kind of went away and that vaccine never <laughs> happened. It was, it was getting there through late phase three, but there's no guarantee we will get a vaccine and you might argue you'd faint on the floor to be hyperbolic about it if the first one we tried worked. I mean, it would just be, that would be something. Uh, so that, that has to be said. One way to speed up uh, vaccine development is a challenge study. I don't want to spend all night on this, although I'm one of the big proponents of doing this. It is a big ethics headache. What you do is instead of waiting for nature, to infect you once you've had an experimental vaccine, you brew up a weakened strain of the COVID virus and you deliberately infect uh, the uh, subjects uh, with this uh, weakened or sometimes called attenuated uh, virus that you made in a lab. So you're hopefully giving something that is strong enough to get a reaction if they've been vaccinated so you can see if they made immune uh, chemicals. And at the same time, you don't want uh, anybody to get harmed and get really sick from COVID, so you're trying to give them a weaker strain. Advantage of this is you can assemble people in a single place, probably say four to 500 of them. You give them the thing and you keep them uh, under <laughs> lock and key. You keep them in a facility, you build it next to a hospital. There are about four or five of these things around the world where they do test uh, different uh, things. Uh, and they could be used for this kind of a study. And you know exactly when they're infected and you know uh, what's going on in terms of their responses. And so you get a faster answer and you get more reliable data. No one's dropping out of this thing because as I was joking, you kind of imprison them in the vaccine study center. Uh, ethically, why don't we want to do this? Uh, critics say first, you shouldn't be harming someone deliberately. And if you're giving someone a even a weakened vaccine that violates do no harm, which is a core ethical principle. Secondly, we don't have to do it because we can get an answer from the standard uh, studies and uh, we don't have to subject people to this kind of uh, thing. And then it's not gonna be so fast, some people point out, because you have to brew up the weakened uh, form of the virus and that takes time. So just to quickly answer those objections. It is true that it takes time to brew up the weakened vaccine, but I'm here to tell you it's already underway. I know that they're doing it at the NIH. I know that there's definitely one program in Oxford that's already brewing up a weakened form of the virus, getting ready to do what's called a challenge study, the deliberate infection, should people decide that they wanna do that. Uh, yes, we can do the big study, but if the first two or three vaccine candidates fail, what we're talking about here is recruiting 20, 30,000 people each time you get the next candidate. That's slow. If you build the system with the weakened virus and you only need to find 500 people, assumedly you can go from candidate vaccine to candidate vaccine to candidate vaccine much more quickly. And I'm willing to say that it's probably as likely candidate number eight is going to work before candidate number one does, although I'd love to be proven wrong about that. But you know, uh, we'll see. Some of the uh, vaccine candidates that are out there involve using uh, genetic manipulation.
to try and trick cells into making immune chemicals, antibodies, but we've never had a vaccine made out of those. Those are called mRNA ones. That's the Moderna one, for example. But we never had a vaccine made that way. People love it because it looks like it's faster to manufacture, but it doesn't mean it's going to work. So I think ethically you could do a challenge study. There's big fights going on about this. Uh, they will continue go, to go on. By the way, you could also do a challenge study and the standard study at the same time. If things weren't working out, you weren't getting any resistance in the challenge study, you could pull the plug on the other one and save yourself time that way too. But uh, anyway, I'll stop there. Any questions on challenge studies? Uh, I have a yeah. question. Oh, go for it. Wait, yep. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, well, what are the ethical issues involved in administering investigative vaccines to imprisoned people? We know it's, it's going like lightning through prison yeah. populations. So what about that? When you start these challenge studies, you can't use a vulnerable population because you're worried that they can't consent. They're going to try and say, I'll do it because they want to get out of jail or get parole. Also, compensation gets to be a big issue. You don't want to overpay people so they don't pay attention. To the fact that it is risky, uh, I don't mean to say you know, it's not risky to get COVID. It is. We know that it can be very risky. But the other main reason, Wade, is prison populations usually have two or three underlying diseases. I know on TV, everybody's at the gym and looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But in fact, hepatitis, HIV, drug abuse, there's a bunch of reasons why they're not the best subjects uh, for, for any uh, beginning studies. Thanks. Okay, Maybe so one I more on that. And, and Hannah and others, if it's um, when you're asking a question, I think it'd be helpful for the speakers. We'll do this all week. Just identify what what your publication or your news outlet is. So Hannah, hi, um, my name is Hannah. I'm with Crosscut News, um, and I I read an article in the New York Times where you were talking about the value of challenge trials relative to vaccine candidates that are likely to fail and recruitment is difficult. Um, and I've also read that people are less likely to be receptive to vaccines at all um, if they don't know that they're reactogenic, um, which this one sounds like it may be. And I'm wondering what you think might be hurdles, especially in America where people are um, oftentimes less inclined to get vaccines even in the face of uh, death. Uh, what recruitment strategies might be beneficial to people if we don't get to a point where we're doing challenge studies? Yeah. Well, look, resistance to vaccines has been growing pre-COVID. Had big problems with measles. Some of you in the West Coast were covering the Disney World outbreak. There were outbreaks of measles in New York, in the uh, <clears throat> Orthodox Jewish community. A lot of states have been fighting. I was involved in fights in New York and California about getting rid of religious exemptions to childhood vaccination requirements. And Maine passed that too. Other states did not. But in any event, <clears throat> there is a lot of concern about vaccines, some of it provoked by stalwart anti-vaccine folks who, by the way, have been around as long as there have been vaccines. Uh, uh, even Benjamin Franklin didn't vaccinate one of his kids or inoculate him in a smallpox outbreak, and he died. He said it was the worst decision he ever made in his life, but it was, he was influenced by anti, at that time, inoculation or anti-vaccine uh, critics. So uh, there are other people just hesitant. And here's something that I try to tell government officials and industry people never to say, we're moving at warp speed. Maybe you like to go at warp speed if you're like uh, late walking through the hall and you gotta get to your office because you're on deadline. It's a little less exciting to go at warp speed if you're driving around on the highway. Uh, trying to uh, get to something and you kill somebody. And warp speed, without saying we're going at warp speed to a safe vaccine, safe, makes people really nervous. I do think we're trying to get a safe vaccine and we can come back to that in a general discussion, but you better say that otherwise, and this is to your question, Hannah, people won't sign up because they think these things are just rushed. All I hear about is speed and racing and warp speed and faster and, you know, and then you add in the fact that there's a lot of stories appropriately that point out that people are making money and that uh, people are selling stock time to the release of preprint papers on not even peer reviewed sources, but preprint servers. That can really make it tougher to recruit because people then don't trust the whole space of vaccines, whether it's research or to administer them for 
uh, prevention purposes, it relies on trust. It's that simple. Uh, if you don't have it, you can make 10 great vaccines and you're gonna really be behind the eight ball. So I am nervous if this thing isn't framed right, that we scare people by talk of speed and we scare people by talk of making big money. Those have been two historical reasons that have grounded vaccine hesitancy and some vaccine resistance. All right, let me move on here. I'm just zipping along. We'll leave some time. Uh, we did that. Next slide. We don't have to beat the challenge studies to death. All right, so let me uh, sort of go here in my last uh, wind up of topics. And this will only take me about seven hours. It's like uh, talking to Fidel Castro at this point. But a couple of, uh, no, I'll get it shortened down. These are really the big challenges. If you get a vaccine, presume you had a success, right? So we get one and it looks, let's be generous. It's 60% effective and it reduces the intensity or severity of the disease and we're all happy. And everybody's writing headlines that say COVID epidemic over, vaccine found, yay. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I think that's when things are going to get actually interesting, even if the worst thing is we don't get one. The next worst thing is we do get one. <laughs> we got to figure out what to do with the damn thing. So uh, these are problems. I, we've mentioned a little bit how effective does it have to be. Um, if it's 60%, you certainly don't want to give up on those drug agents to work in parallel. You don't want to tell people, hey, throw your masks away. You know, we don't care. Everybody out, back to the bars, get a tattoo, go bowling, whatever it is. Um, they've got to continue to be careful because the uh, um, effectiveness is going to be limited probably below that herd immunity I was talking about. It's not going to be big enough to prevent easy transmission. If you're looking at uh, duration, I mentioned some of these things require two shots to get enough response. But what if it only lasts six months? Are we going to then go back and vaccinate, let's just talk in the U.S., 330 million people, two shots is 660 million doses. If you have to do it twice a year, where you've just gone over a billion doses for the U.S. And I will ask you, investigative journalists, when was the last time anybody, anybody made a billion of anything safely and reliably? And that answer is correct. Never. That didn't happen. I mean, at minimum, and I know vaccine manufacturing very well, but as I told you, I've been looking at the area for a long time. Plants go offline. Crap breaks. You can't find a part. It turns out that, yeah, we got the vaccine, but we don't have the right size needle. Uh, it doesn't work in little kids. We never thought of that. We got to make more of them. We got to, I mean, there's a ton of things that can go wrong just on manufacturing. If you have a brief duration vaccine, even if the FDA says, look, the data looks great, let's approve. If the whole thing burns out after six months, that's going to still be a big problem. And that also relates to cost. So some Vaccines are going to be have their price set by a private company that has the intellectual property. I believe Moderna fits that model. Um, they can charge what they want. Now, I'm sure they're going to be under a lot of moral pressure to not charge exorbitant prices. But if you had to give two shots every six months, we're talking a lot of money. So uh, that those will be issues. Distribution, I'll say something about in a minute. Uh, how safe is safe? What if we did have somebody die? Would that shut down the whole thing? And there is no correct answer to that. It's partly a judgment call. What are you willing to trade off as a regulator before you pull it? Uh, things have been pulled with a single death. Many years ago, a gene therapy experiment at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was, got shut down by a single death. And it took about 20 years to get the field of gene therapy back and going. Other things have had more than one death and have continued. It's kind of a regulator's call, to tell you the truth. So if you think the benefits are so huge, you sometimes plow ahead in the face of safety signals. That relates to an issue that no one seems to be talking about now, too. Let's say I say I didn't die, but I got disabled or I've been injured. Who's paying? Who's covering? 
It's a country that doesn't have universal health insurance. The answer to who's paying is different in the UK and Sweden where you're part of a health system that's gonna cover you. In the US, most insurance companies, private ones would break into hilarious laughter if you said, I'm coming to you with a vaccine experimental related injury. So it's not gonna happen on the research side, but even on the therapy side, it isn't clear that you wouldn't be involved in a lot of litigation to get money for your long-term care or restoration of function or whatever it is that you or your loved one needed. So those are issues too. Let's go to the next slide and we'll mark these a little, little bit. I mentioned, there's no guarantee we're gonna find a vaccine. This is just showing you some sad news. <laughs> um, length of time, failures to find it. Um, a lot of optimism comes in in the 12 to 18 month time frame. This is Rick Bright. Remember, he was the guy who got in trouble. Uh, I will confess, Rick Bright is an old buddy of mine. He was at Barda, director at the time. He's been installed in some broom closet at the NIH. I haven't seen him much lately. But uh, at the time when he was funding vaccine research at Barda, he was trying to uh, tamp down optimism. And it's partly because of those facts that are up there on that slide. Next one. Delivery. So we did mention prisons in other places. When you get a successful vaccine, that's nice. It's in a uh, factory uh, where hopefully manufacturing is going well, but it has to be moved from that factory or multiple factories to people to take it. So there are all kinds of challenges with this, getting it to prisons, getting it to slums, getting it to remote towns and villages like, I don't know, Alaska. Um, there are lots of places in the world that are conflict zones and failed states and people in refugee camps, and they are nice incubators of COVID. Um, who's going there and who's running the vaccine program? Some of you will know the polio program has been hindered in some countries because they keep shooting the vaccinators in Afghanistan and Somalia. So those are challenges. Uh, and then there are obviously suspicions that hinder uh, vaccines going anywhere by governments or by populations. An interesting thing, someone's here from Foreign Affairs. I see the Russians keep saying they've got a vaccine. Is that trying to court political favor? Russia has never been known as a vaccine manufacturing place. I don't think the FDA has ever approved a Russian built vaccine here. Are they trying to curry favor with African and Asian uh, lower income countries? by offering them something, would uh, anybody be monitoring to see what the hell's happening with those vaccines if they went out there in the short run? So uh, it's a challenge. And polio, my old disease, is eradicated almost today, uh, but it's only taken about 30, what did I say up there in the slide? I can't even read my own number. Anyway, it's taken decades and we're still not done. So distribution worldwide, quite the little headache. Next slide. You mentioned effectiveness. These are just to show you uh, probably our best uh, vaccine is measles. I'm not sure I didn't put it up there. That's probably about 92%, 93% effective. Mumps, not as good. Rubella, very good. Whooping cough, not as good. Many of these need boosters. So again, uh, there are going to be a lot of people, even if we got a vaccine that was approved and we were all pleased with it, there are going to be many people who don't respond, most likely and they're gonna to have to do behavior or take a drug to treat it, they, or hope for an, uh, another vaccine that maybe they would respond to. But the idea that a vaccine will roll out and everybody in the world will respond to it 100%, that is not something you should plan on or you should be ready to question anybody who says that. Next one. This is just the duration thing reminding you again uh, tetanus as a vaccine is a great vaccine. I also think that's in the 90%, but you have to take it every 10 years. Most of us don't, uh, but you should. It does weaken. Flu comes in annually. That's partly because of mutations in the strain, but nonetheless, it's something that we have to do every year. HPV and cholera require many doses. The standard required in the U.S. is three for HPV uh, over months. Hard to get good compliance. I think the number of American women who've had three shots of HPV hovers around 30%, maybe 20. Um, 
not good. Uh, and if you're spacing out, you know, the vaccine, it's got to come 60 days or something uh, apart, then it's hard to get people back for the second one. So those are all uh, questions which would pose uh, difficulties in distribution. Next one. U.S. manufacturing capacity for vaccines has been uh, slipping. Uh, they're not big money makers for, or historically haven't big, big, been big money makers for pharma. Uh, measles and mumps and these kinds of things don't make them a lot of money. They do much better with drugs. Some of the newer genetically engineered ones make more money. The COVID one, if it falls in that class, can be sold or will be sold at a much higher rate than the couple of bucks that we're making on measles. Um, but let's say your factories to make uh, these uh, vaccines are located outside the U.S., which many times they are. So Belgium has been a big place for vaccine manufacturing. And the idea is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Merck contracts to make vaccine in Belgium. And if it works and FDA approves it, then we expect the Belgians to stand there as the boats get filled with vaccine to ship to us while they don't get any. Maybe. We'll see. Um, China, India, Vietnam make vaccines, um, Russia, but they may not meet FDA manufacturing standards for safety. Um, one interesting story angle that I don't think people are paying attention to is the whole world runs around looking for a COVID vaccine. Every other stupid disease that we vaccinate against is going in the toilet, including measles, which parents in the US are not getting for their kids because they haven't gone to the doctor. Um, I know this because the manufacturing numbers and shipping of measles vaccination from the two or three companies that make measles vaccine is way down. So if you want to get a nightmare scenario for uh, late in the year, you could have COVID come back, the flu start up and measles break out. That's my uh, super duper trifecta of misery. Um, but the rest of the world also is relying on vaccines and manufacturing capacity. When you hear somebody say, well, we're going to make 300 million doses. Well, it's not like we built a bunch of new factories to make 300 million doses. It's coming out of somewhere. And the question is, what's the overall impact of a COVID surge in vaccine production on the rest of the vaccines, uh, rotavirus, things that the world uh, depends on and probably uh, for many parts of the world are getting more people dead from other diseases than they are COVID. Uh, a lot of the times you need refrigeration. You don't just put a vaccine in a truck. It has to be kept at a certain temperature. It has to be kept by the doctor in a certain place. There's often waste and shortage, just trucks don't get there in time or temperature gets too high. You have to teach people how to administer the vaccine. These are all bottlenecks for the rapid distribution of the vaccine. Again, when I say, everybody's, we're going to see a vaccine at the end of the year. And I keep thinking on what truck, from what plant, at what rate of production, if it's a two dose vaccine, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I am in the complete skeptic camp that we could roll out anything like a coverage for a lot of the U.S., forget about the world, by the end of the year. That just strikes me as absurd. Um, so vaccines are more likely to roll out gradually. Next slide. And that'll let me finish up with something we can let you go, which is okay. So if they come out gradually, one of the great ethics questions. Uh, I love this question. It's good for the bioethics business. People want to write papers about it and talk about it and have webinars on it. And it's just starting to heat up a little bit. And that is who gets it first if you don't have much of it. So I'm going to break that into two parts and then I'll be done. We can just go to open questions. First part is, who goes first in the US? Well, one sensible thing is to take first people who are most at risk and protect lives. And that seems to me morally reasonable. We all know that healthcare workers, many have died because of exposure in dangerous environments with blood and intubation and dialysis, um, and also nursing home personnel. So they'll probably reasonably be first in line. First responders, ambulance, police, fire who handle patients and bring them in. Uh, nursing home residents are high risk, but then we get to some other interesting categories. Our friends in prison, uh, will, the pop, will the American people say, yes, yes, you're right. Before we vaccinate my children, 
why don't you go down and vaccinate prisoners? I think the answer to that should be yes, but that's politically gonna be interesting. Similarly, for a variety of reasons, poor neighborhoods, poor people, minority people, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics have been harder hit by this vaccine. We should be going there if we're trying to figure out how to prevent deaths in the at-risk group. But again, it's a political question. Will the citizens of Ridgefield, which I believe has a black population of 0.1%, be very pleased to see the first supplies go to the Bronx? Political. And how are you setting that up to convince them that that's the right thing to do? And sicker people, they're obviously at risk. Uh, whether or not they respond to the vaccine, well, we'll have to see. After you sort of handle that, then you're starting to think a little bit about a separate variable, which is how do you control the spread of the vaccine? So you may want to go to Miami or Atlanta or Texas or Phoenix, if you were today, and try and get people vaccinated so that they don't spread it back to lower rate places by travel or going to college or, dare I say it, by playing Major League Baseball or uh, whatever, uh, you know, back and forth is going on. So there, that's an epidemiologist question, how much to use to prevent risk of dying and how much to use to control spread, but those are important. Remember I said we gotta to continue to study right through this period what's going on because there could be people not responding. We don't wanna waste scarce vaccine on say the very old if they just don't build an immune response, there's no point. So we have to be watching that. Hopefully we're not just all running around delivering vaccine without having a registry, a follow-up. Will there be a black market? There will absolutely be a black market. Every vaccine I know of has a black market. It's usually not very big. It usually doesn't even get punished. Um, even back to uh, poor countries, there are definitely people, uh, leaders and rich people diverting vaccine to them. But in the US, we've seen it too. You may remember in both uh, swine flu and avian flu outbreaks, there were people, you could find a doctor who would uh, sell you the vaccine. Um, and I expect fully that we'll see it here, what we're gonna do about it, punish it. I haven't sort of heard much pl planning. And then there are people who are gonna say, I don't want it. Okay, that's not gonna be a problem initially, but are we then gonna say, if you don't, then you're gonna to have to mandate mask wearing or more testing and more quarantine if you're positive. Is there a price if you won't vaccinate uh, there? Next slide. And this will be the, another fun issue to get into. So that was all the US, right? Distributing there, but let's get to the world. The WHO, the UN, every day I wake up, sometimes when I'm on phone calls with the WHO and everybody's saying, you know, every life is equal. And what we must do is guarantee equal access to everybody around the world when a vaccine appears. That is what, in my view, constitutes naivete in, in extremis. The battle will be the countries that make vaccines or say they own them, Germany, Belgium, the US, China, vaccinate their own people and go way beyond the people who are at need to cover everybody before they then say, now we'll start to distribute elsewhere. And, um, that, I'm gonna call that nationalism versus the one-worlders. The, the international organizations all sound like a kumbaya peace uh, organizations where everybody counts and we're just as likely to take a US vaccine and send it to somebody in Rwanda as we are to somebody in Brooklyn. Well, politically, forget that. But even if you wanted to make uh, a moral case uh, about this, Look at that thing I wrote on the red down the bottom and I'll let each of you ponder this as I end. If I have vaccine, is it really morally wrong, forget about the politics, to favor my family, my community, my state, my region, or my nation first? I happen to think that it is not morally wrong to favor your neighbor, your friend, your wife, your county, your country first. What I mean, I'll qualify it and say this, I'd wanna get the people at greatest need in my country first and then look to see what I could do about people at need in other places. But the idea that uh, I live in a certain country and that that country isn't gonna look out for my interests, somebody reasonably could say, what am I paying taxes for? Why do I have a government? 
I didn't want to join the world. I believe that I'm a Canadian or I'm a Belgian or I'm a whatever it is. And part of what that means to have a nation or to have a community is to give them moral priority. That's what it is. So I'm going to controversially say, I'm not sure that it's wrong to start with the neediest in your own country before you go to the neediest in other countries. But that is going to be what I just said is a very provocative position because it is not what WHO, Gates, international groups, they're not talking that way. If uh, you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask. And if, it gets, if we get too many people chiming in at once, I'll manage it somehow. But we'll just open it up right now. Let's start with Natalie. Yeah, I mean, I was just curious about, uh, you know, how can the government, how would you, if you were a government official, prepare, start to prepare the American people for the reality that if this comes out, it'll come out in limited qualities, you might not be first, because that's a very difficult mindset that everybody's kind of in right now. So here's some happy news. You'll like this. Who's in charge of the decision right now? Nobody. There's a commission that was formed at the National Academy of Medicine. There's the President's Advisory Council, which I believe is on an island of Elba somewhere. We don't hear from them very often anymore. There's HHS. FDA has no authority over distribution. It just approves things to, for sale and distribution. It doesn't say who. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't even say how effective it has to be. We need a national commission made up, I think, of a broad spectrum of interest groups. People represent teachers, nursing home patients, minority people. You know, you can make up the stakeholder list and give them the authority to prepare the public to get ready for some hard decisions and then explain why and to be transparent. I think everything they do should be in the open. Uh, there's been some talk about uh, what's the White House thinking. They say we're not talking. Uh, there's been some talk about the National Academy of Medicine doing it. It's a bunch of people like me. They're academic nerds. That's not the right group to make that decision. I mean, I'm happy to read their report. I'm happy to hear what they have to say. That's not the right group to do an ethics job. So that's what I, I think we had to put somebody in charge who represents that the country would find credible. Okay. So we have, I, I, we have people who have raised their hand through the, the hand raising function down at the bottom. So we'll, we'll go through those. Uh, we'll go to Juliet, then Rachel, then, and then Adriana. So Juliet first. Uh, thanks for that presentation. Um, Juliet Beverly from BrainFacts.org. I wanted to go back to the part about animal models and should we be paying attention to the type of animal model um, that a lab has used before they went to or are claiming to go to phase one? Yeah, and there has been a little bit of shortcutting on some of the animal studies generally to hurry things up. Remember I said we were looking at some of these viruses uh, in the cold family to try and get somewhere. So people have been a little more willing to say, you know, we already did a study on two other cold viruses, look pretty safe. The general animals are mice and rats, but there is an animal <laughs> that uh, gets used sometimes, ferrets. And uh, why ferrets? Ferrets have a very funny property, they sneeze. So if you line them up in cages and you're trying to see who infects one another, a ferret study is really good to understand transmission. For the most part, I'm not too worried about shortcuts with animals right now, because uh, I do think they had a little bit of background work that they were doing in some of the labs before COVID. But yes, I mean, you'd be happier if they did the ferret study too. That's a standard model for vaccines to watch uh, infectivity if, if it's diminished from animal to animal. Okay, uh, Rachel. Hi, um, thank you for, so much. Um, I'm one of the um, uh, more novice reporters on science reporting, um, but I wonder if you could, if you know what the flu vaccine capacity is the, this year, like are people already planning to try and give more people the flu vaccine in hopes of um, avoiding your nightmare scenario? And also, um, you know, if you could talk, if you could simplify a little bit your talk of effectiveness, like how high would herd immunity need to be for 
the flu vaccine if if COVID, the COVID-19 vaccine will be analogous in effectiveness to that. Thank you. So on the, in fact, on the second one, you kind of watch how easy it is to get this. Ebola, not so easy to get. You kind of have to touch people and have body contact. It doesn't really blow in the air. Measles, really infective. You need to get to like 90 two, four, five percent to get herd immunity because it's transmitted so fast. You know, we've been watching some papers come out now suggesting that it's not just carried on droplets when we sneeze and cough. It may be aerosolized, as they say, in the blowing around on small particles. If that turns out to be true, it's going to be more like measles and you're going to need bigger uh, infection rates. It also, for those of you writing about this, it adds in something else, which is ventilation starts to matter in addition to masking. And if you're going back to school, it might be nice to make sure you had some ventilation in the ancient decrepit school buildings. Um, on the first question, which was it? What were you at? Well, um, I, I, how about um, how many flu vaccines are going to oh, be available? Flu situation. Okay, yeah. Well, the first flu vaccine just shipped. Uh, it's just starting to ship now. Uh, it will ship now so that it can be available September-ish in CVS and Rite Aid. There's going to be a couple of interesting questions. One, is the flu vaccine in any way protective against COVID? Nobody really is expecting that, but they'll be looking because sometimes you get an overall immune boost by getting a flu vaccine on other things that you weren't expecting. Second, people absolutely have to be encouraged to get a flu vaccine, but the average population pre-COVID adults getting flu vaccine, 35%. It's, kind of, it's really bad. I was involved in, in rules and legislation to mandate flu vaccine for healthcare workers. In many parts of the country, they have to get a flu vaccine, so they will. But getting adults to get vaccinated, by the way, it's true for COVID vaccine too. The way you get good rates on measles is you uh, insist that they can't go to school without the vaccination. But with an adult on the flu vaccine, there's no penalty. There's not even a real way to run after them. So I don't know. I'm a little more nervous about my dire outcome in terms of many things besetting us until people realize, hey, they're serious. I better get down there and get a flu vaccine. So you, so you don't think there'll be a limitation on the number of flu vaccines available? It'll just be a Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you did ask that too. And the Can honest answer to that is I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so uh, just uh, Dr. Kaplan, it looks like we have, we have five or six people who have their hands raised. So I'm good. We'll, we'll work through, through all the questions, you know, kind of think in the 60 to 90 second answer or so, so we can get through everybody. Um, but uh, Adriana next. Hi, Adriana Rodriguez from USA Today. Uh, so we said that they were five manufacturers, correct? And two were in Europe. So is the ability to get vaccines from those manufacturers hindered by our recent plans to withdraw from WHO? Or is anything in your presentation of the process of vaccines hindered by it? Teeny bit. WHO has no enforcement. It's like a gigantic ethicist. It has moral <laughs> arguments, tries to shame people, but it can't make anything happen. So there'll be a lot of yelling and screaming if countries hoard vaccine and or say a private company says, yeah, we got a vaccine and it's a hundred bucks a dose. Good luck, uh, you know, Molly, we wish you well in coming up with that kind of thing. Uh, I think the biggest impact of withdrawing from the WHO is that it gives you less leverage to get into arguments about where the vaccine goes once you've addressed it in the US. We don't get into the dialogue as much. Right. I mean, morally, not practically. Remember too, a company that owns a vaccine privately has the right to sell it and distribute it as they wish. There are some laws that would let the government take over. In France and the US, I know, they've never done it. Maybe they would this time, I don't know. But in general, the distribution decision, say for a privately held vaccine owned by a company with stockholders is by the company. And there are not just five of these, those are the five early ones. 
I think there are 200 plus in the shoot of different vaccine candidates. I never saw anything like that. Okay, um, Anna Sussman. Thank you. Um, a cu two questions. One is um, with the challenge trials, uh, the part about not having a treatment um, for COVID, I mean, I, I know there's been articles about this, but I'd just like to hear your discussion and how, when you're doing a kind of uh, bioethical reasoning, how do you weigh that? What are the sort of rubrics or metric decision-making process you use when you're weighing these different things? Um, secondly, I was curious about, you said like people selling it on the black market. What exactly would be the channels through which a doctor would get it? It's just having a relationship with the pharmaceutical company. Um, yeah. yeah, and then what happens is people learn that uh, shipments are going out of the docs from company X and they start to say, oh, I'm gonna to talk to that truck driver and see if I can divert it over here. We see it, believe it or not, with blood and blood products yeah. are made in Europe. They get put on boats and all of a sudden the boat that was supposed to go to Baltimore to deliver it to Johns Hopkins is on its way to Taiwan. Yeah. So there are ways to finagle access yeah. to products, sadly that go outside the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, on the challenge study, you sort of think it through like this. How can I minimize risk to the people willing to take the chance? And one is to take younger people to start in the challenge study so they're less likely to get sick. Two is to build a facility near a hospital so if they do get sick, they're right there and they get entry. Three is you have to come up with a compensation policy for them mm -hmm. if they do get hurt. And four, you have to remind them, even if they don't volunteer to get deliberately infected with a weak uh, virus, they could get infected with a natural virus if they're not in the study. So yeah. it's not just a question of, am I gonna make you sick? It's a question of, is the risk significantly different from what you would encounter just wandering around in uh, Texas, in East Texas, being exposed potentially to the virus, a, a stronger version of the virus, so that's how you sort of think it through. By the way, there is a, a group called One Day Sooner that has about. I, I saw your signature. People. Yeah, I saw your signature on it. I was just curious yeah. how you how you say like we're going to expose you to something for which there's no known cure. Well, you know, it's interesting. Y Z benefit. Okay. The question is, yeah. first of all, there is a little bit of a cure at NYU when we had people with COVID. Mm. Our ICUs, we actually cured them. I, I can't speak to long-term <laughs> impact on their heart or whatever, but okay. saved their lives about 30% of the time. So mm. that we didn't have anything. Secondly, a lot of research, let's say you took the experimental vaccine mm. and you went south. We don't have a way to fix that either. People die in phase one studies mm. because we don't know how to rescue them. So part of the answer is how good a rescue do you need? Mm -hmm. had a drug that could treat this thing 95% of the time, then the rush to make a vaccine would be, you'd go a lot slower. Because now, <laughs> you know, you got a treatment. It's not as good as prevention, but, you know, so it's kind of a relative uh, situation is what I would say. So it's almost more of an argument to push for a vaccine because there's no cure? I wouldn't say more, but I just don't find that objection that if we don't have a treatment to rescue you, we can't proceed. That would stifle actually all drug and vaccine research for everything because we don't have cures for these things when we start, when we go first in human. Does that make sense? I mean, we don't have a rescue. That's why we're hunting around for something desperately. Thank you. All right. So let's go to uh, Sony next. Hi, Dr. Kaplan. Uh, nice to see you again. I think we spoke maybe a month ago about challenge trials. Um, my question is actually about diversity in trials. You touched on this briefly. And as uh, this summer, uh, a lot of the companies ramp up their phase three clinical programs. We've heard a lot that diversity will be really important because it's important to recruit a group of people who is being impacted by the virus. But I haven't seen any sort of um, quota or specific promise um, about the portion of people who should be from um, uh, uh, minority ethnic or racial backgrounds. And I'm curious if you think that there should be some sort of 
a requirement from FDA or perhaps some other regulator to have that sort of um, quota in place. Yeah, well, there are two reasons to worry about uh, poor populations or particular minority groups. One is they have a higher need. So you're trying to recruit them in to reflect the fact that they're probably going to go first, Native Americans, African Americans, when you distribute. So you're very concerned about uh, safety, just making sure. Second, poor people generally have a little bit more illness, which is probably why they're impacted negatively by the COVID vaccine virus in the first place. They have untreated chronic illness, they don't get good health care, and so you're nervous again about making sure that that group mm, is adequately reflected because of comorbidity. So both of the reasons are safety. To me, you need to recruit until you get a size of a population likely to be in need. In other words, if it's 20% of the people who die from COVID are Native Americans, just to make up a number, we should be recruiting until we get a pretty good size sample of Native Americans. Even if we get to 30,000, we should keep going. That would just be the prudent thing to do for safety, if that makes sense. So I might say we stop at 30 and we got to recruit 2,000 more Native Americans. We're not going to stop the study until we get them, but you want to keep the effort going because you really need that safety profile. So are you saying, just to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, are you saying that the portion of people who we should be aiming to recruit should reflect effectively the portion of people who are being affected by the virus? Yeah, roughly, and that's for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I think we got seven people aligned right here. Uh, we have Angeli, David, Taryn, Emily, Kira, Jillian, and White. Um, and so I guess try to keep it to one question, maybe a very brief follow-up so we can, you know, we'll, I think we'll be, you know, we'll get out before nine. I don't want to, I want to get lots of questions in. I don't want to keep it, uh, go way, way too long either. So let's by go. The way, if somebody had a question uh, that they don't get to ask, just email me. I'll try to answer you that way too. Okay, let's go to Angelita. Thanks. Mine are actually really quick. It's just to what is the likelihood of first, an EUA by phase three, and two, the vaccine needing to be a seasonal one like flu? Yeah, seasonal, I don't know. It's just a danger, but I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, on duration, it's like it's, there's no data yet that answers that. And then on the first part, I'm going to say pretty likely because I think politically, being able to say you got a vaccine is something that the White House wants to say. So I think we are gonna see, that could be an October surprise. I'm not saying it's 100%, but I would 60-40, that somebody's gonna try and pull an emergency use of a vaccine out of their pocket and say, I told you I'd have it, here it is. Okay, uh, David. Yeah, um, I just, I I was going to ask about the EUA situation, so I'm just going to elaborate on that question. Um, FDA Commissioner Hahn uh, told JAMA this morning that they would consider an EUA if they felt that the risk outweighed um, the risk of not having a vaccine. But how does that change um, between preemptive EUA versus just waiting for a phase three trial? Like what? Presume, presuming that the phase three trial would be ongoing and you would have some indication that data works for a certain population. FDA yeah, so has the guidance you, saying that they're going to have- You think in the right way, there are, there are two paths to an emergency use approval. One is we're pretty far along in the study and there are groups that are at serious risk. And even though maybe we only got 15,000 people, we think the data looks good enough to open the door to people who have big risk. The other route is people are at such huge risk of dying, enormous risk, that we're going to compassionately make it available. That's what we do with some cancer drugs now, some gene therapy agents for end stage cancer when there's nothing else. But it's hard to imagine COVID fitting the ladder, right? I mean, nobody's like at death's door and saying, pump this in my pancreatic cancer, maybe it'll salvage me or rescue me. So I think it's going to have to be, or it ought to be, if we really started to get positive results, 
a data safety and monitoring committee looking at the data said, boy, this is looking really pretty good. Let's let somebody use it who's at high, high risk, say nursing home residents or something based on a 15,000 uh, midterm report. All that said, you may have seen me say, and I mean it, giving an emergency use waiver in the middle of vaccines is tricky because again, it starts to make people not trust it. It looks like you're shortcutting. Okay. Um, when do you expect to have readouts of a preprint at that point? Public I don't. Before I the don't. UA? No. I don't. No. Okay. But there's some politics there. It wouldn't be the first time somebody called up the FDA commissioner and said, hey, you know, looking pretty good there, aren't we? Okay, let's go to a Taryn. Hi, yeah, I'm Taryn Mento with the San Diego Public Media Stations. Um, I, I wanted to add on to Sony's question a bit. Um, in terms of recruitment, are there industry... <laughs> Are there industry um, standards or um, you know general approaches to strategies for reaching underserved communities, minority communities? Like we know that it's a problem, at least in San Diego, just to um, reach the Hispanic community in terms of contact tracing. And I know a lot of uh, we have a trial site here, and I know they're worried about getting enough of a diverse pool. Uh. I will confess that my wife is the CEO of the Bronx VA. She couldn't get protective gear into that place in the Bronx on a bet. We stink at it, it's poor. We just don't do it very well. Okay. Um, so let's go to uh, Kira. Hi, Art, good to see you. Uh, my question is about pedi pediatric testing for a vaccine. We know that the uh, vaccines in several cases are going into big phase three trials with 30,000 adults, but I haven't heard anything about pediatric testing and I'm wondering about the route for getting an approval for, for that kind of a vaccine. Yeah, it'll come much later, Kira. The, uh, I don't see any kids getting enrolled into this, these initial RCTs for the current vaccine agents. I don't see any pregnant women in there. We always yell and say, put <laughs> women of childbearing age and pregnant women in. The companies never do because they fear the legal liabilities. So they don't do it. So those groups and kids are likely to be in the second generation. And that's also because this is seen uh, a little bit less as a pediatric disease. Not that it isn't, but you know, it's, it's seen more as an adult disease than it is a kid disease, rightly or wrongly. Uh, so that's driving, let's get them in the next group. Okay, um, Jillian. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, I, just to add on to the EUA uh, stuff, I mean, do you have concerns if this gets approved on EUA in October? Um, I mean, do you think we're gonna have more than preprints pre available? Um, are we gonna have the data on it to actually know that it no, I don't think so. Not by October. They're just recruiting now. What are we in? August 1st? You're not going to know anything by October worth anything. So you'll have some really early signals, but just signals, let's call them. And uh, I am worried that uh, the other half of the equation is who's really at such great risk that you'd have to have an emergency use approval I mean, people are at risk. I'm not denying it. And I, you know, my own mother died of COVID in a nursing home in March. I know what it's doing to the elderly in nursing homes, but would that be enough risk still to justify an emergency use waiver on an elderly population where you're not even sure they'll respond to the dose? I, I'm, I'm going to be in a wary camp. Okay. Um, Emily. Hi, Emily Mullen with One Zero. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any um, notable historical examples of challenge trials. Like, I know that these have happened before, but are mm -hmm. there any ones that, um, like, 
any major ones or any ones that like really made a difference in accelerating um, a drug or vaccine approval? So I'm going to answer that in two ways, but it takes a longer answer than I'm going to have time for. Edward Jenner, when he first did his smallpox thing, basically thought he had a pretty good vaccine. He vaccinated, he grabbed the, uh, the kid of his gardener, infected him with, uh, or gave him the uh, uh, agent that he thought was the vaccine and then deliberately infected him with smallpox. The kid got better and the entire world began to, it was an N of one uh, study on a coerced subject. So that goes back to 18 something or other. I don't remember when. So yes, uh, it, I think vaccines began with challenge studies, rabies a little bit too like that. But nonetheless, um, they have been used in cholera and uh, Ebola challenge studies models were used there. And they are used, in fact, in an entirely different way. This is when we get out of the COVID era. You can remember this first story. If I want to test bleach or perfume or household products, I do it with a challenge study on a volunteer paid subject because all I'm trying to see is if it makes them sick. There's no benefit. It's a pure safety study of commercial household products and stuff like that. And there are entire companies that just do that. Remember I said there were companies set up to do challenge. They, they, they come out of that part of the experimental world. And as strange as it is, you know, you pay somebody a hundred bucks and you put some pesticide on their arm and, sort of see what happens. Um, so that world has been around a while. It just doesn't get much coverage. Okay. So we have, um, we have wait, Lisa, Melissa, and Leslie, and then we're gonna have to call it quits. So um, four more questions will be done by nine, um, but we'll go to wait right now. Okay, thanks Art, this has been super helpful. Um, we, you mentioned that one company, if it develops a, a good candidate that's safe and effective, it'll have rights to distribute that and, and manufacture it. But is there a compelling ethical case to be made that um, they, because they won't be able to distribute to the whole world, they'll be lucky if they can distribute to the United States alone, that the IP of that should be yanked into the public domain and made available the knowledge about synthesis, packaging details, cold chain. Yeah. Know, I'm going to say yes. I think that's a good question. And I think sharing the IP uh, in the middle of a plague is not usual business and they should uh, try to do it. Now, maybe they're gonna demand a price for that and so on, but the point of you can make this too, yes. I, I think that's gonna be one hopeful solution to that distribution problem. Just churning it out of factories in one country and shipping it and, and getting it out, that's, that's like, very hard. Thanks. Okay, uh, we'll go to uh, Melissa. Hey, Art, it's uh, Melissa Healy hey. from the LA Times. Um, can we talk for just a minute about uh, phase four, the, uh, the phase in which basically uh, Americans are, the, uh, are effectively the guinea pigs mm -hmm. and a much broader uh, uh, range of Americans than obviously were were rolled into the into the phase three trials. Um, liability, uh, um, the, the the prospect that there will be, uh, you know, the, the the collection of adverse events, um, information, uh, and the simple question of. Uh, again, with a with a rushed vaccine that ha that that is avowedly imperfect, uh, why would anyone want to have priority to uh, to to get that? So, I mean, a, a lot of different questions, but that the the jumble of how to how to make people understand that phase four is really about uh, is a great big question. Yeah, phase four is just as big an experiment as phase three. And we don't usually think that way. Mm -hmm. The usual way all of us think is it got approved by the FDA and we're done. Okay. And you know, Melissa, occasionally a drug company is told it's a tentative approval at phase three. You got to go out and do a phase four surveillance. And about 20% of the time they do it. But they're not, phase four is not our proudest hour. I haven't heard any company tell me what their phase four registry and monitoring and surveillance plan will be. 
all they're telling me is I've made it sure that I can manufacture 300 million doses of this by, I don't know, Tuesday or something. Um, so I don't know. And then on liability, I think it's a great big black hole. We have a compensation program in this country for vaccine injury. Does COVID fit? Is anybody put it in there? I don't know. So I, I, I believe not is my answer, but that I'm not 100% sure. And then even if you put it into a uh, vaccine compensation fund, is that going to make people more likely to take vaccines or less? You know, you say, well, look, the good news is you get compensated when you get hurt. And people are like, well, you made it at warp speed and now you're telling me you're going to pay me when I get hurt? I, I don't think I'm taking that. So there are interesting behavioral and psychological questions about how you present the fact that you would make good on an injured person, whether it's in research, by the way, or uh, in a uh, post-approval therapeutic agent. But is there talk uh, in Congress of uh, passing a liability waiver? I've heard one word. Not one word. Nope. Nope. It's all speed, speed, speed. Yeah. Okay. Um, Leslie. Just a quick question. You mentioned briefly that older folks don't do so well with the flu vaccine. Is there reason to think then that they won't do so well for the coronavirus vaccine? Is it like a population that needs this the most may not yeah, there respond is well? A reason. And part of the reason I think they die faster is their immune systems fall apart as they get older, to be blunt. There are many things that fall apart as you get older, but the immune system appears to be one of them. And so you just don't build up antibodies and resistance to everything. You, you're more likely to die of a cold or respiratory infection and so forth. Um, so yeah, I think there is reason to be concerned that they are in an immune compromised state when you're, it's probably people who are really over 75 is what we're talking about. It's not people 55, but uh, yeah, I think there are changes in the immune system that make you more likely, you know, the flu is devastating in the elderly. It kills tens of thousands. Most of us just get it and sort of don't like it, but we trudge on. But it's a signal that we could have a real problem, at least needing to build up a much bigger dose to administer to the elderly for COVID. Is that true for other vaccines? I mean, I don't know that other, that if older folks are trying to get measles and mumps, they've already done Well, older done folks it. get the shingles vaccine. It's not true there. I haven't heard worries about that. A pneumonia vaccine is given to the elderly. It's a multi-dose thing. I think they are getting dosed a little bit bigger for that, but that's not one. The shingles one isn't used on young people, so I, it's, it's hard to compare it, so to speak. Okay, and final question to Lisa. Um, yes, um, thanks, Lisa Krieger, San Jose Mercury News. When we start to see data about immune responses, can you talk about which ones matter? You know, I know they're neutralizing antibodies, but there are other antibodies. What about T cells and natural killer cells and, and yeah. myeloid cells and all well, that? Well, you're giving me a good one to end on, and the answer is nobody knows. So we're not sure okay. which parts of the immune system kill these damn viruses. We don't yeah. know. So every vaccine guy says, hey, I'm getting great response out of these T-cell killers. And you're sort of like, okay. And that means what? And that isn't going to get answered until you run that darn RCT on the big numbers. You, you, you don't know. Uh, as you know, too, some of these things trigger an immune response of certain cells that then kind of quiet down and go away. Right. And does that mean the dosing is related to, you know, some subparts of the immune system sort of uh, that's what we do with colds. We keep getting reinfected with colds and it, it looks like the immune system isn't really built for the long haul and responding to the common cold. So, but I, I, we don't know. That, that, that's an honest answer. So uh, let me end by saying again, if you had a question or something occurs to you, email me. Uh, I'm happy to try and answer you or send it to somebody who could answer if I can't figure it out. And uh, the other thing I'll say is if you want to follow some of what I'm writing or what our project is doing, just send me your email and I'll put you on our little uh, uh, media list for papers and statements. This working group is going to have something to say soon about who should decide. We'll try and push for a commission and stuff like that.